KK Miller Voice, man on the street. We are in New Hope, Pennsylvania, our second state. The day today, we hit chiller earlier. We met Lita Ford, and now we are the main course of the day is John and Bob Gallagher from Raven. Hey, everybody. Good to be here. Gentlemen, today we're here to discuss 41st anniversary yeah. of All for One. All for One. I have a couple of questions. Of course. You did a little tour. What, what, well, actually, what was the original for the, the release date of this? I can't find it. To re- it just said 83 in a couple of places I looked it up. Cool. I want to say, I think it came out in August. August. Yeah. Yeah, it came out as we did the Killing Wolf for One tour. Yeah. So it came out before the Killing Wolf for One? Yeah, it came out in the middle. Yeah, too, uh, towards the end, I think. It had been released in Europe and it was brought out by Megaforce. Yeah. Like just into the tour of. It had been brought, I think it was released in like March of 83 um, in Europe. I remember that because we were trying to get it to all co- coincide, but we just didn't work out the Dean Diddles and then what then we did with Johnny and stuff. Because he, he, he was kind of starting his label. We were talking about that in the car on the way. You were on Neat Records first, but when you came to the United States and Canada, you were on... Well, they're licensed. They're like, they're licensed. They're still licensed from, yeah, from, uh, from Neat. From Neat. From Neat. Look at you. To be honest, we were, we were kind of like... <laughs> We were trying to, in some ways, get off of the records because they had limited kind of uh, funds, limited scope, and we were trying to do mental capacity or bigger and better a week. And we were just trying to get something together. Look, it's like Batman, the fear of the altering. Well, it is the anniversary. Yeah, I'm celebrating. So, celebrating. So, um, I just remember I was like, well, what kind of focus was to try and get off new records and get to something bigger and better so we could be kind of branch out and be more, you know, like, uh, throughout Europe, more in the, in the States and, of course, all over the world. And this was our third album, so there was like um, a lot of expectations for that record and we wanted to make it, I think one of the things we wanted to make it so that it had a much better sound than the other the first two were yeah i think the catalyst for that was we did in 82 the f- maybe early 82 before we did the white now record we did a radio one session down in made of in london and in for one day did four songs and left this sort of around you can hear them they're on some of those expanded version things uh and it was a revelation because when i went into this big studio where it, Tony Wilson, great producer, a great engineer, boom, 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 just played it and it sounded fantastic. It was just like, we have to go back to the neat studio where everything's held together with chewing gum and sealing works and yeah. duct tape. They had a machine that when you, when you recorded, when you pressed the buttons, the button would just pop off and fly around the room. So you had to go and find the buttons and put them back in <laughs> to make, a, make the tape machine work. Very limited equipment. I mean, the first record, there's a, the only outboard equipment that for anybody who knows about equipment was a Roland Space Echo. It was the only outboard effects unit, which is basically an echo or reverb. A, a little small thing you would use for a guitar, so not for an, a studio. And so it was very limited, you know, what they had. And uh, we just made the best of it. And it, looking back, the first two records are great because they have the energy and all that. But sound wise there's some limitations and we just wanted to have the better like a, a better record and then we also wanted to have somebody else help us take some of what we have and kind of you know kind of channel it and make it more powerful and everything so we look for uh, somebody i'm a producer it, you know we knew what we wanted but we weren't stupid enough to think we knew everything which is just like we heard the the radar out and my accept and said oh this is great we like this Who's the guy that did this? Let's get him. And the producer's name was a guy called Dirk Steffels. And then we found out he had nothing to do with it, really. It was all Michael Wagner. Yeah. He was there. Get Michael Wagner, you gave him a call. Yeah. Got him. And then he came, like, a, he had spawned a production company, him and Udo, and Michael and Udo, and then they came as a package. And I remember Udo that didn't speak, speak a lick, lick of English. He didn't speak English at all. Now, he's listed as a producer. Did he actually produce all yeah. He did. He was there for the whole He was there for the whole Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He came up with some. They came for the pre-production. Right? The pre-production. Yeah, they came off in Newcastle. 
and we went to it was Ronnie's drum shop. He had a big basement and we set up in there. Um we just played the songs and he'd go he'd make notes and go, Well, you're doing this here, why don't we do it there? Da, da, da. And he had some great ideas and we just worked on the arrangements and then we went down to the studio in the suburbs of London called Pineapple Studios in South Hall. And it was a, there was a definite step up from what we were used to. There was the house engineer there who was keep trying to steal what Michael was doing. But the immediate thing when we when was, met Michael was we hit it off at media because we had a great sense of humor. And we were just immediately just laughing and having a great time. So it was like a no prayer and it, it, it clicked immediately. And even to this day, I said, call him up and it's just a, it's a good laugh. It's a, that's why we did, we'd done three projects together with Mike Hoping. That, that makes a difference with him. Yeah. And of course, All For One being the first, then One For All was the kind of the follow up that we did with him. We also did Stay Hard. Because yeah, Stay Hard was a really like, difficult uh, project. We had started that and then we were in the middle of, well, is it going to be on Megaforce? Is it going to be on Neat Records? Is it going to be on another label? And then the label wanted certain things. They wanted to change a few things because, um, you know, we were trying to do something uh, a little different, a little from what we'd done before, but we wanted to make it like super heavy. Right. And they were kind of like, oh, that's that's what, kind of what we had in mind too. So it was a little bit working with him. That, that beginning of that was kind of a, a, kind of a big stamp to who we are, really. And we still play a lot of songs from this record to the day, yeah, you know. Uh, would you consider yourselves the one of the forefathers of Thresh with with the uh, Modad? Oh, they keep they throw them yeah, terms around big time. Well, except because past the shot. That is, I don't know that one's well, and maybe a couple of other songs. Uh, think about these names, these names like Thrash, whatever these names are. That they would be. We were doing this before their names were came out. You know, we were ahead of that exactly. So I don't know how everything was in a box. So I don't know. They just want it. So lump everybody into something so that everybody can oh, understand. Oh, it's like really fast and aggressive, all right? Because we were listening to like, uh, you know, of course, Deep Purple, Priest, Sabbath, and so on. And we kind of kicked it up from them. We wanted to make it more aggressive. And, and that maybe is a little bit of a punk. Yeah, there's just going to say, there's a slight punk edge to you, man. I think there is. Absolutely. So we wanted to make the, have that aggression and, and like kind of kick some doors down, you know, make it more more intense, you know. And if, if, it's, if it's fast, we're going to make it a little faster. We're going to do more. So in the thrust thing, they kind of took up some of what we were doing, and I guess bands like Board Ahead, uh, except would be one of them, uh, several different bands, and then kicked that up a little bit, you know. There's all bits of that. I mean, everyone talks about Excite by Judas Priest. That was like a double kick song. It doesn't sound that fast now. Back, back then, my name changed. I was a kid, that was the fastest beer I ever heard it. Uh, Call for the Priest of Sin After Sin. That's, that was a fast song, a little one too. So that that all just went in the cement mixer for us, and we just like took all that and did what we want to them. But uh, it's it's like when they talk about the new wave of British heavy metal. Oh, it was a movement. Yeah, like we all had membership cohorts. You no, know, it just sort of had. It was just a time period, right? yeah, exactly. and a lot of young bands, a lot of young kids didn't like punk, but they liked heavy music, and they had a lot of passion and a lot of energy. And all those bands sound totally different from each other. So there's no new way of British heavy metal sound other than low budgets in many cases. Like there's no Iron Maiden did not sound like Def Leppard, did not sound like Saxon, did not sound like Raven, did not sound like Venom, did not sound like Diamond Head or I think it's cool, but a lot of their bands from that time period are still going. They are. And if you look at diff all different kinds of styles of music, a lot of them that stuff doesn't last. With that stuff is kind of last. You know, Venom or Venom Inc., these different bands yeah. are being around and are still doing, you know, doing it and kicking ass. And it's it's great because they've, they've definitely proved it has stood the test of time. We forget about you guys. You're still out there doing it. That's every year or year or, yeah, this, you know, of course, this year's our 50th anniversary. This is 41 years. We're well, your 50th yeah. happy anniversary, guys. <laughs> um, but, it's, you know, it's the, the embryo of the band, the 50 years, of course, because... We decided to start a band, and then we said we we really need to learn how to play play some guitars now, because we had no clue how to do anything. We, did, we decided we wanted the band. It's funny how if you put your mind to something, you can really make something happen out of nothing. 
and it's a good testament to, to that. And there's a lot of ups and downs we're able to cause, but this 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 album kind of stands out. We came out with this record, and um, it made an impact. And then we're still, in some ways, competing with this record. Not really, because we're competing with ourselves. We we already moved on from this, but it, in as far as like history, because. We had to, like like people who were in high school had this was the album they were playing on probably on a cassette in the car right, right. on the Camaro you know what I mean and how do you compete with that having right. emotions and that like if people were in high school it's it's part of their your life you know what I mean you can look back to them times everybody does so we were up against it like that history of, of the record and what we're trying to beat so you've noticed the last three records have been getting stronger and, and actually in some ways have eclipsed these records, especially um, uh, re review-wise and stuff. This was never reviewed that good in the beginning. I think people didn't get it some, somewhat. Not like that. And, it, and we have people now that they, they, they'll come say, listen, you're now the off. This the best you've ever been. And that hell is incredible. And, and we, that's what we were trying to do. And you know what, how we did that? I'll tell you, that for everybody listening, uh, watching, that it was about hard work. It was doing much more, writing more songs, like much more time spent going over the lyrics, over every little part of it. And and, and that comes from the heart, from love of, of doing it. Which is like, we need to work harder yeah. than that. So it really is. That was, you, to, you just got to work hard. You got to put the time in, you know. You know, song's great. Like the intro sucks. What's this stupid beat you've got off your yeah. chorus? What, why start there? Could we do something better then? Yeah. Could we take it out? And sometimes the smallest thing can just polish it from a rock to a diamond. It's not about even about success or about achievement. It's more about love of what you're doing because we just, even you'll see tonight when we play it, we love doing it. We just love it. There's a song on the end number, the, last, the second to last song, Seek and Destroy. Yeah, you toured with Metallica for their... Kill them all, and this is the awful one. Great tool. Right. Yeah, two bands with this with the same song title. Did you guys uh, ever talk about it? If discuss? It? Yeah, we did. I just never well, laughed about it. Yeah. In the way, as we did, we never heard either. All we heard in Metallica was uh, "No Life to Live." And I just remember hearing like uh, "Hit the Lights," "The Flash," "For All," and, and, and looking good. And the speed right on this was a, sound like more that it's metal, you know. <laughs> now, you, I haven't seen you since you did the little show in Tampa for Johnny. Like Johnny Z was like a crazy guy, but he was also like a visionary. Like he was. And another guy that like worked like crazy, he would be like acting. We stayed at his house and he was in his office downstairs like all through the night just calling people. He would like, he would find out what time it was someplace and call up. Hey, if you heard this band, they're the greatest thing on earth. Listen, you need to do this, do that. It'd just be like promote, you know, like a constant, like a machine. And he just, he was a fan first. And uh, he had a love for music. And um, even like, you know, in the, in the la in later years, he was no longer managing us and we weren't really connected business-wise. But he would call John up from time to time and say, oh, I saw you playing this festival. And he was, what about the set list? What are you looking at? And he'd be like, oh, that would be good. I think he should do this song, and that's it. He would be, he'd be still managing life. Talk to him to me just before he died, like maybe two, three days before he died. So it was a, it was a great shock, right, when he died. Johnny Z said, my, the top three bands of all time. It was Raven, the Talica, and the Grateful Dead. Full Dead, that's right. He was a big dead fan him. All right, so what, what bizarreness, right? And then he would say, one time we had something, we were trying to get a, a tour or something, and, and it fell through, I forget what happened. I was kind of a little bummed out. He goes, there's only one thing we could do. I said, what's that? And he goes, go to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> and then said, we all, we all band, jumped in a car, and a couple of guys from Anthrax, and we all went to Chuck E. Cheese, just stuffed ourselves with pizza and playing stupid games. We're playing whack-a-mole, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Do you want me to look for a Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, come on. For That's what he meant. For for that, for that, for that, I love that story because it sums up Johnny Z. He was kind of, he was a different kind of guy. We did that show Metallica, of course, and they really honored him and, and his wife, uh, Marsha, because I mean, they went above and beyond, I think, because they don't have to, you know, they got enough going on. And they did that special show, and then the, uh, Johnny's kids, kids were there. It just represented that whole time when we all kind of came together, and it was about around the time of all for one, yeah. And, and for us, it, all for one kind of 
made a little bit of a first step into the U.S. And then, by the way, we were discussing this before you just saw it. We, we never told her Rob after he left for about five years. Then I had a business thing come up, got her on the phone. We were on the phone for three hours. So, yeah, everything was split to sort of out, yeah. whatever. You know, why did he leave? Was tired of all that? He had a lot going on. He was uh, hot and too hard. He got a kid on the way. And he just said, he could see where it was going. He just says, I have to get out. I have to get out. But I was doing good now. And it was, uh, you know, it was the right move for him. It really was. It was kind of nice to what a weekend out with Rob. It was just like, with the we picked right up where we left off. Like, like th- it was 37 years since I've seen him. So it was kind of cool to reconnect. You know, it was nice. So, but like you said, we had taken, we are still taking all for one that, uh, you know, seminal record, the third album. And, and it's really a stamp of who we are. We still play them songs live. Most of them, and, and of course, we did the whole album in its entirety in, in the UK too. I still look back fondly on this record, and I, it's it, to me, it just we made it, we made it, definitely made a stamp. And um, you know, it, 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 although was, and that's not taking anything away from the other albums, it just means that this particular record, and it's because of the title track, somewhat, all for one, one for all. It's it's like we're connecting with the people who come to see us. You know, we're all kind of together. Charlie yes, says in the beginning, look, are, you all, are we all together? 50 years later, I'm still 40 years later. I don't, didn't know you in the 50th year, but, but around 45, I, I 40 years, I met you. Yeah, I, right. I was at the I was screaming. Yeah, it still sounds good. It's the rules up, and two of the trucks, especially, take control and rain over metal. The first note on the metal, and it's just like, bah. If not, we're actually it, it, we're doing a, a, a box set. For this record, you are. It's going to come out. It's going to be um, a, a little bit of everything, but it also includes a lot of rare stuff that's like beyond what's on this record that's to do with this project. You know what I mean? You have all the archive stuff. Yeah, we have a lot. Is it from the and the I pr- got a lot of cool. We're really into that really lately. We're trying to do. Yeah, what? We, we, we do this list. We do this bootleg thing now. We're doing a bootleg every tour, which is only available in our merch. We don't sell it online or any, anywhere else, no record. You got one down there tonight? Yeah, and it's live in Paris from 1991. That's Joe, that's pretty much, that's pretty much the Architect of Fear tour. And then the other one is, the other one is Stay Hard tour, and that's that was a live radio broadcast that we did for King Biscuit. And uh, that's awesome. We, we, we only had half of that for many years. And then we somebody give give us the rest of it so that we had the whole show. The people in there, they don't even know what that is, but it was, it was if you should look that up. I can just go to flower hour. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for your time, guys. Congratulations. Nice to see you. Guys, we're looking forward to a great show. I appreciate it. 50 years of rainbow.